Shall we run with it? Yes. Hello, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> We're having some technical difficulties today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to hand this over to David. Well, thank you and good morning, everybody. It's been that kind of week. I'm in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, we had three inches of snow on Tuesday. So um, it's been an interesting week. Thank you for joining me. Um, I'm a former remodeling contractor, did it for over 25 years, and about, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, got into some speaking and then some business coaching and uh, really enjoy. In fact, I'm going to be seeing you in November at the Remodeler Expo. So we just thought we'd do a little primer here. And here's the, the, the program, how to find and qualify your best customers. S simple question for all of you. How many of you have gone on a sales call and when walking out the door, simply said to yourself, I had no business being here. I just wasted my time. If we've got a chat box, raise your hand. And I think most of us have experienced that. And Andrew, thank you very much. The, the reason, when you think of the time that this takes, putting your materials together, driving to meet the client, meeting with the client, discovering there wasn't a good fit, driving back to your office. We're talking four hours, loosely speaking, half a day, and we can't spend that amount of time doing this. Simply speaking, Harvard Business School talked about resource poverty, and all of you as entrepreneurs have experienced this. You're wearing many hats in your business. You do whatever is required, and time is your most limited resource. So let's see how we can protect that. Let's focus on qualifying so that any client you decide to go see, you know is qualified before you even get in your car or truck. That's my promise from the program today, that you will never again go on an unqualified sales call. So, we're going to talk about both finding your ideal clients and then qualifying. So I'm going to start on how to find your best clients. And, and I wanted to say that this is not a program on social media. So I'm not going to focus on that, but instead, just based on my experience as a contractor, I want to focus on and share just simple day-to-day -day activities that you can implement at a very, very low cost that will help drive your marketing and sales pipeline. So, two elements to a good lead. Number one, the project, as you might imagine, what do you do best? Now we'll talk more about this, it's the client. So let's talk about the project. You know, and, and ask people if, if you had an opportunity to, to build your business or rebuild your business and just focus on certain projects, what would those be? For example, custom kitchen and bathroom remodels. Uh, it could be basement remodel, uh, remodeling. It could be, you know, additions, uh, second story additions and renovations. So basically, I like asking contractors, what is your spot? If you had the ability about, and in many cases, in fact, in most companies, uh, companies develop almost a certain niche where they find they're good at doing these projects. And part of it is because of doing this again and again, your skill set, the skill set of employees really help propel your profitability because you're doing things you do well. But let me add one more thing, geography. All right. When I talk about your good clients, that's element one. But number two, when I talk about geography, where are those jobs? And here is a very simple question I'd like to ask. How many of you discover that in the last 10, 15 years that virtually all of your projects are in two or maybe three zip codes? Can you raise your hand if you've discovered that once you got into a neighborhood, Andrew, thank you again, that once you got into a neighborhood, that you continue to get work in that neighborhood. And really what we're talking about now is client demographics. And let me give you a very specific example of this. 
uh, I was working in North Arlington. It's a suburb just south of Washington, D.C. And got to do a project. It was a second story master bath and bedroom addition. And it was a half a block away from an elementary school. And I didn't realize it at the time, but in doing the project, we had our job sign up. That guess what happens every morning at elementary schools? Now, at, you know, we, with the uh, social distancing now and the schools and, and, you know, online learning, it's a little different, but it will return to this hopefully sooner than later. But many parents drop their kids off at school. And I had the benefit of people driving by my project and discovered within the first six or eight weeks had 10, 12, 14 calls for clients who had driven by my project wanting to find and out more. Keeps dropping. Yes. What's that? Allison? I'm sorry, right. go ahead, David. Should I just keep going? Yes. Yes. Okay. So discovered that people driving by my projects were calling because of the locality. And we had three projects within that three and a half month span of work that came from parents from that elementary school seeing the work that was going on. After I did those three projects, I actually contacted a marketing company. And I said, can we determine if there's some commonalities between these clients? And here's what they came up with. In this one zip code, we discovered that my best clients were uh, combined income couples at the time, you know, making over 125 grand a year. They had lived in the area for at least four years. They had at least one elementary school child and their home was at least 40 years old. Those were the shared demographics. And they added one more element. They said, all these couples also share, have two cars. So I said, so are you telling me that within this one zip code, you can help me find people who got combined incomes of over 125 grand a year, whose homes are over four years old, 40 years old, who've lived in their home four years or longer, who have at least one elementary school child and who own two cars? They said, yes. I said, do it. And a number of hours later, I got back a report and there were 270 households in that one zip code that matched my ideal client demographic. So I said, run this, guess what? I just found a targeted mailing list. And I found that through understanding the, gra the, the demographics of my good clients. So I want you to think, you know, when you look at your best projects, what are the age of the people? How long have they been in their home? What's the age of the home? Do they have children? What are the age of the children? What are their combined incomes? There's some really uh, uh, very good marketing information that marketing companies like Market Sharp, and I'm going to get into that more in a minute, they can help you target these clients and deliver your message to those people who may want to do what you're doing now for your present projects. I need to add one more story to this because I was doing this exact program in Southern California and turned to a gentleman, I think in the first or second row, and I asked him, do you know who your target client is? And he said, I sure do. I said, who are they? He said, well, they're married couples between the ages of 65 and 85. And I said, that's interesting. Kind of empty nesters, downsizing. He said, no. He said, we're building custom homes between six and $10 million. So trust me, there was a, the, the room got very quiet. And I'm looking at him and saying, so let me summarize what you just said. You're working with married couples between the ages of 65 and 85 building six to ten million dollar homes he said yes i am and i said do you have a target market do you have an area have you defined the location he said i work in two square miles so let's summarize that again working with couples over 65 building six to ten million dollar homes 
in two square miles. So he had everyone's attention at this point. Well, it turns out he was working in Beverly Hills and he had done a project for the chairman of the local country club. And, you know, these are large homes and, and the chairman of the local country club, they have events at their home. So the members coming to his home, seeing the work that had been done and understand that a six or the $10 million home, it's a three to five year investment. And so I had to ask him, I said, help me understand, you know, why do people over 65 build a $6 million home? And he smiled and he said, number one, who cares? Fair. Number two, because they can. Here was number three. He said, this is actually the, the, the honest answer. He said, these were all retired and successful business owners, literally. And he said, they're bored. And so when... And they put together these custom home designs. It involves both husband and wife. It's creating, you know, their forever home. They had thought about this, you know, for the previous, who knows, 20, 30, 40 years. So he was assisting them with building the home of their dreams and would involve both spouses, you know, in, in a very deep way, in a very intensive way for three to five years. So, I want you to think about the demographics of your best clients. Where are they? Income level? How long have they been in the home? The age of their home? It will help you find and target because if you did projects for past clients, there are future clients who want the same thing. Now we're doing this because marketing is simply a numbers game. You speak with more people, you'll make more sales. So it could be I get 10 inquiries on my website, I follow up, I end up with three qualified clients, and I make one sale. And I'm just making up the numbers. But if I know what those numbers are, I can then adjust my marketing pipeline. And how do I bring more people into that funnel so that I can speak with more people? Now, there's two parts to this. One is bringing people into the funnel. And the other element is recognizing the element of time. The marketing survey, if you look at the screen, discovered that almost 80% of consumers who found out about a product or service, that 80% of those buyers did not buy the product or service from the person who first introduced them to that product or service. The one thing we don't control is time when they decide to buy. So what I want to introduce or just certainly recommend, hopefully most of you are doing this, is some consistent, predictable plan to keep your name in front of potential clients. So it can be a newsletter, it can be an open house, um, it can be you know targeted mailings, and let's talk about that. If you really know your sweet spot and what you do best, then part of this is when you know what to say yes to, you know what to say no to. And I want to highlight that because as a building contractor going through, gosh, four different town downturns. And I say this, it sounds somewhat joking, but it's not that much of a joke. It took me 15 years to learn how to say no, to say no to jobs that I knew were not what I was best at. And to know that in saying no, that the better jobs would come. And even then, when I was working with my clients, if they were bringing up ideas that I knew was a bad idea, but to say to them, that's not a good idea. And when people said, no, we're going to do this, to have the courage and the foresight to say, this is probably not a good fit. So basically, I can't emphasize enough. You know what you do well. So say no to unprofitable work. But create a marketing presence and a brand in every neighborhood you work in. So let people know you're there. So number one, you're going to start with a job sign. Number two, I'm a big believer in uh, what I call pardon my dust mailings. And I can send you an example. If you'd like to see an example, five by seven postcard, uh, multicolor. And again, five by seven, not three by five. And it's got a, a bulk mail stamp on it. It can go right into their mailbox because it is legal bulk mail. And all you're saying on, and this is a man, 
you, you're, you're starting a project in a neighborhood, you put up your job sign, and before the project starts or the week the project starts, you're sending out this pardon my dust note. And the pardon my dust, dust note simply says, we're gonna be in your neighborhood working on one of your neighbor's homes. If there's any inconvenience as trucks or people are coming and going, please let me know. We don't want to be a burden. Here's my name, here's my contact number. Guess what? They'll look at the postcard, they'll see your logo on the front, the colors that may be involved with your business. Maybe they'll spend 15 or 20 seconds, but in most cases, then that five by seven postcard will go into the cir circular file. Well, guess what? They know you're in the neighborhood. Now they're driving up and down the street and they're gonna see a job sign, all right? Branding. Now, if it's a longer project, let's say three months, I've had people send out pardon my dust mailings in the middle and saying work is going well. If you'd like to find out more about what we're doing and what's possible, please let us know. And again, five by seven postcard. And always at the end, which is we've wrapped up our job. If we can be of assistance, we'd be happy to assist you. Um, great neighborhood, you know, due to the de demographics here. If you'd have any questions about a potential project, please let us know. Well, what's happening is every time they see the postcard, they see your logo. Every time they drive by your job, they see your logo, they see your name. And if your truck has signage, guess what? You're, you're, you're getting this repeated branding every time people drive by. So in regards to these proximity mailings, marketsharp.com, they'll do everything. They'll put together the postcard, put together the art, create the postcard, put the bulk mail stamp, and in a targeted fashion, mail it for you. Uh, the bestpostcards.com is another company I just discovered. They'll do something very, very similar. And when I come back to really working on high impact work, I don't want you, you know, to, to put together these postcards. You've got too many other things to do. But there are companies that will do this for you. And I'll guarantee you, on a block of 20 houses, 10 on each side, I'll guarantee you that at least 10% of the people on that block, at least two households, are thinking about doing work on their home. So as they contact you, you add them into any kind of marketing pipeline, any kind of list follow-up, but let them know that you're there. Now, what I want to do is show you, I think, the best job sign I've seen a contractor ever create. And I'm happy to send you a sample of this also. He took a standard job sign, but you can see he put it on sawhorses. And remember, when you've got a job sign, people are driving by. They don't have the time to stop and read. But if they drive by, this doesn't look like a standard real estate sign. It doesn't look, it doesn't look standardized. Anybody walking by this knows their construction work going on. Driving by, they're going to notice this sign. And if they drive by, they're probably going to make a point to come by and say, what is that? So take a look at this. Because all he did was take his sign, and you'll see just the metal sawhorse legs. He just screwed the sign down to the sawhorse legs. And you'll see then he planted the legs by rebar into the, <clears throat> into the ground just in case there's high winds. But I really like that sign, very expressive. And again, simple branding on a regular basis. So if you've got people contacting you now, and again, that targeted proximity mailing, I know you know there are people in that neighborhood who are thinking about getting projects done. So let them know that you're there. So now let's, what, what, what's the message? What do we say to them? Well, it's not that I've been in business for 20 years, licensed and we do good work, everybody does that. So here's a different tip. I want you to ask 10 good past clients, and I can send you the text on this if you're interested. I want you to ask 10 good past clients, why did they work with you? And I've got a simple little email I send, which is, you know, thank you, I'm sending a note, I want to follow up, thank you for the work we did on your kitchen, I hope you still enjoy the work that we did. 
I'm trying to uh, update the marketing message, you know, that I'm communicating to the clients I work with and I could use your help. I've got one question to ask. The one question is when you are looking to get your kitchen, your bath, your addition done, what did we say? What did we do that allowed you to feel comfortable hiring us? Simply, why us? So I want you to think about sending that message out to 10 good past clients. Now, when I say good past clients, these are people that if you ran into them in the grocery store, you'd stop and talk for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You like each other. They love the work that you did. You work together in a very collaborative fashion. All right. When you send out a note like this, these are people who want to help you. And I've done this before. I've done it, gosh, with probably 30 different contractors. And I want you to see the responses that you get. And people will tell you in their note, you took the time to listen. You were patient. Um, you understood what they wanted. And you took the time to not only work with their dreams, work with their budget. You listened to what they had to say. And what you'll see in these notes is they'll communicate to a large degree the experience that they provided, that you provided them in one of the most, you know, impactful investments in their life. It's their home. And remodeling projects are expensive. And so any good client honestly wants to hire a contractor that they trust. And so when you get this messaging back from previous clients, they'll be communicating a, a number of the intangibles that you brought. And what I want you to know is when you can take this messaging and put this in to your marketing message to potential clients, trust me, when potential clients read why past clients worked with you, they want the same thing. And when they read these intangibles, the trust, the ability to listen, the time that you took to understand, they'll say, wait a minute, that's what I want. So I want you to really think about your best clients telling you how to share that message with future clients. And again, if you want that wording on the email, let me know. I'll send that to you. So I did this and, and um, shared this story at a trade show on the East Coast. And interesting enough, the owner came up afterwards and he said, you know, I want you to know that we've been doing this for like 25 years. And he said, when we sign every contract, you know, when we're getting ready to start a job, we always ask, why us? Why did you choose us? And here's what he said. And I literally, this is, I quote, after every signed contract, we ask, why us? After 2,500 customer surveys, cleanliness, politeness, and trust was the common thread. And you can see, I just copy and pasted their company letterhead. It's right from their website, DBS Remodel, when cleanliness, politeness, and trust matter. And they deliver on that promise. All right. So we've targeted our good clients. We know who they are demographically, you know, psychographically, and we've got people calling. So here's just a sample lead sheet and you all have this. So it identifies, you know, the contact information, some demographic information on the home, which I mentioned earlier, and then reviews the type of the job. And I want to review this with you. A sample lead sheet, because when someone calls, the owner or salesperson may not be the person taking that call. But let's collect some key information. So you'll see here in the very beginning, name, address, spouse, telephone, cell phone. And you'll see that's all about location. But to the right, you see I've got a rating of one to four. Now I worked in North Arlington and had a great deal of success in North Arlington due to my client demographics, client and, demo and project demographics. So let's pretend that call came into my office. If that client was calling from North Arlington in that zip code where I had so much success, I'm giving it a four, all right? That's my target neighborhood. So already 
it's got a four. Now you see the next section, that's information I customized because it's their own home. What's the age of the home? I mentioned the homes I worked on were over 40 years in age. How long? That if they'd been in the home four years or longer. And then just other information. When are they thinking of starting? Either starting or completing. Are they talking to other contractors? And again, my office manager, you know, in 10 minutes can collect this information. And then ask about, you know, what work are you looking at having done? Well, look, if it was a whole house renovation, a room addition, if it was anywhere, you know, from one to four, in my business, that was also a four. It was my target project. Now, let's say it was a roofing job, all right? A window replacement job, all right? It might be in my target neighborhood, but it's not a four because it was a window or roof job. So in that case, I'm going to give it a one, all right? And I'm going to circle back to that in just a minute. Now the source of the lead, and again, rating the source of the lead. Let's say that this person wants an addition in North, Cli in North Arlington. It's a past client referral. Ding, 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 ding. That's a four. In fact, I'm going to give that a six. If it's a past client referring a potential client, asking in my target neighborhood for a project we do best, that's my job. All right, I've already got a warm lead because of that referral. So I'm doing this because when I came into the office, there could be four or five, six, seven messages waiting, things I needed to get back on. Well, if I found this lead sheet on my desk and in red, there was a 12 circled in red, that's the first number I phone call. I return the call. But let's say it's a roofing job and there's only an eight or a nine. I'm still going to make that call, but not with the same urgency. But I'm going to make that call and say, you know, I don't do roofs, but I work with a roofer who I've been with for 10 years. He does great work. Can I share his number with you? In fact, can I give him your number so he can call you directly? Would that be helpful? In every case, clients are going to say that would be wonderful. And at the end of the call, I'm going to say, you know, we do full house remodeling. So let me refer you to my roofer, but in the meantime, if there's some renovation you want in the future, please let me know. Guess what, you'll be a hero, all right? They just wanna work with somebody they can trust, you can assist them, and you leave them with a very favorable impression. So let's go now to the people we actually begin speaking to. We've got the lead sheet. If we come back to the lead sheet here. I've got a red 12 sitting on my desk. So before I go out there, I'm going to audition that client. I need to find, all right, can they use my products or services? Is it a good fit? So I'm not going to go out on an unqualified call. And um, I may spend 30 minutes on this call. Because what I've discovered is good clients want to talk about this. And here they have a licensed contractor on the phone with them. So the time you spend on the phone may be proportionate to the size of the job. So imagine somebody calling in your target neighborhood, saying, I want a kitchen. Uh, my neighbor who you remodeled the kitchen for just referred me to you. Can you help me with my kitchen? So instead of responding with, oh, yes, we can, I'm going to give you a new response. In every case, when somebody says, I've, I've gotten your name, I've seen your work, can you help me? Your new answer is always, I'm not sure. Do you mind if I ask you some questions to find out more? Can I, can I learn a little bit more about your project? In every case, the potential client will say yes. And I want you to know that I asked that question because now I have the floor. And I'm gonna compare this qualifying phone call to a doctor's diagnosis. If you have an issue, bad knee, shoulder, back, foot, and you call a doctor and you say, can you, you know, help me? And you go into their office. A good physician, the first thing they'll do is they'll start asking questions because I don't know if I can help you until I know more. So approach this qualifying call in the same fashion. So I'm going to go through eight questions with you. And again, I'm happy to share this PowerPoint with you if you'd like to, to duplicate this 
or customize it to your own business. So I always started, here was that first question, gosh, how long have you lived in the area? Remember, I worked quite a bit in North Arlington. And this is kind of that bonding question. Gosh, I like the area, beautiful area, rolling, and it really was a beautiful area. Gosh, I've done four, six, 10, 12 projects. Um, in every case, you know, the projects have gone well. Um, I just want to talk to them about their home in the area. So we start there, and this lets me again, demographically understand, you know, are we starting where I want to start? Number two, and you've all done this 200 times, 300 times, tell me more about the job. What are you thinking of doing? Tell me more. How long have you thought about doing this? Interesting. Have you tried to fix it? Gosh, have you given up trying to fix it? What were you hoping I could do? And all this is, is to truly understand not only the scope of the work, but their motivation. And I want to understand, yeah, it's the full kitchen renovation. And they want to put a sunroom off the back of the new kitchen. So there'll be a small addition. Because if I truly understand the scope of work in my own mind, I'm also starting to understand a potential range. All right. I don't know how much the project's going to cost, but people are saying how much will this cost? I don't know. But if I truly understand the scope of work, I can begin to come up with a range. Gosh, 100,000, 150. But I've done kitchens before. We've done some small additions. So in my own mind, I'm putting together a potential range, a financial range. All right. And I'm getting a sense of what they want to do. Now, the third question, and I did this in North Arlington, we did larger projects. And in, in the conversation, after they explained, you know, the scope of work, let's say that's a big job, um, would it be easier to move? And it's a fair question, and I'll almost tell you, and you may have experienced this, that many people, homeowners, when they're looking at a bigger project, they have thought about moving. And when I ask this question, what they'll do is they'll say, we've thought about it, but no, we like the neighborhood. We like the school. I like the commute. I like the community. And what they're doing in this answer is they're telling me they're committed to the remodeling process. All right. Then I'll ask next question. What's your schedule? I'm guessing most of you are very busy all over the country. Contract work is booming. And so you have a schedule. And if a client basically says, you know, I'd like this new kitchen and uh, bath addition, and it needs to be done by Thanksgiving, that we've got people coming. Well, 2020, you know, we're talking, what, half of September, all of October, talking 10 weeks. My experience, please ignore the phone call. My experience is just designing a kitchen can take minimal six or eight weeks. Think of all the selections that go into a new kitchen. Cabinets, countertops, flooring, plumbing finishes, uh, lighting finishes, wall finishes. So I want the client to know, I'm gonna call this a teachable moment. Gosh, you're considering a new kitchen. I want you to know that in all the work that we've done, my clients will easily spend eight weeks just in the planning process. Because my job is not only to get you the kitchen you want, but to work with your budget. And you're going to have a hundred different selections. And I'll guide you through this. But this is the most expensive room in the house. I don't want you to rush. Realistically, if we could spend the next two months planning your project and it didn't start until after Thanksgiving, realistically. Does that work for you? And part of this is, is, is addressing these uh, home improvement show myths where people think these projects happened overnight, you know, extreme home makeover, a five day turnaround. It's not reality. All right. It just isn't. So it's my job as the expert to show them what goes into a successful project, the amount of time that will be spent on design, that will be spent, you know, on selections, on identifying where those selections are, of putting together a budget. 
So we're addressing both the ideal kitchen and the budget. In 90% of the cases, when I shared this information with clients, in 90% of the time they would say, oh, I didn't understand that, but that makes sense. Now, if the other 10% says to you, no, I've got another contractor who said they can do it, guess what? Conversation over. And I'm never going to criticize another contractor. All I can say is be careful. All right. I know what goes into a custom kitchen model. And I know that we'd have no possibility of getting this done before Thanksgiving of both the design selection and construction process. So just be careful. If I can help you in the future, let me know. So let's go on to the next one. What's their budget range? All right. I'm going to ask you how many people ask what the budget is before you go out on the job. It's important. So I'm going to ask people, do you have a budget in mind? And when I do that, I'm going to get the range of answers. Trust me. We don't know. We're hoping you could tell us. Um, gosh, I know where there are a lot of things involved. And the most honest people may say something like, you know, I'm just not comfortable sharing with that with you. And so I learned, and this was through some sales training I got, is to do something called bracketing. Remember, if we go back to number two, that if I've really understood the scope of work, I have some idea about a range of what the project may cost. So if I come back to that, that question, what's your budget? They say, we're not sure. I can then say, based on what you told me about the scope of work, the project you want, because I've done this before, I want you to know this could be done for as little as 100000 but could easily be up to 140 or 150 depending on finishes and selections. Do you think you're closer to 100 or 150? I never had anyone not answer that question. What do you think most of them said? Well, they're kind of closer to 100. They're never going to take the higher figure. But the person I'm looking for is the one that says, oh, gosh, we're not spending over 50000 So when I get that answer, we're not done yet. I'm just going to say, based on what you described to me, the project scope and everything you you wanted. I want you to know that that can't be done for 50000 Now, we could do some very nice kitchen upgrades and really get into a nice kitchen renovation for that 50000 Because if the conversation's been good up to this point, and we've gone good back and forth, and I can ask them, if we really just focused on your kitchen, and I could come out and we could review what you could do for that 50000 would that be valuable to you? And some people will say yes. And I bring this up, even though there's that disparity. When I can get out to the house and we start talking and there's a good interaction, I want to ask you, how many times when you started working with clients did the budget start to grow? But until they got to meet you and still they got, until they got to interact with you, so again, if these initial five questions have gone well, if their budget's low, I'm gonna say we can refocus and I've got some ideas, would that be valuable? When they say yes, I may still go out on that call, but they know they're not talking now about the kitchen and the sunroom addition. We're talking about the kitchen. And as we start to talk and they get more comfortable, guess what, that budget may change. What level of research have they done? Oh, when the prospective caller says, gosh, I've been online, I've ordered my cabinets. Um, I, I'm, I'm ordering my countertops. My brother-in-law's an electrician. I just need somebody to do the install. You know the answer. That's not the kind of work that we do. I want to source, review, and install all the work that we do. Your friend referred me because I work with dedicated subcontractors and suppliers. I know these people are good at what they do. If there's an issue, I just need to make one phone call. It's taken care of. If there's a warranty issue, it's taken care of. I want to oversee all the work that's being done. And again, this was for my, my benefit and my company. But when I ask about research, oftentimes I'm hearing contractors are allowing homeowners to purchase different materials. 
And all I can tell you is I will give people maybe a plumbing selection or lighting selection, especially if it's toward the end of the project. I made the mistake of letting people do a cabinet order. And guess what? Something was missed. A measurement wasn't done correctly. And suddenly this eight week lead time, I'm blown out of the water because now I've got to wait another six or eight weeks to get the replacement, to get what I needed. And it was only because I gave up control. And so I want the client to know, let me source and review. I appreciate the research you've done. Now, most people do this because they think they can save money. But I want you to know I work with suppliers and I will give you my contractor discount. All right. I want to show you how working with me and look, if people are working a full-time job, they really don't want to do this. It's not what they're qualified at, but they're doing it because they think they think they can save money. So my job is to show them you're really not going to save money and you're certainly not going to save time. And again, if I have the ability to source, review the materials when they come in and install, I would give a lifetime warranty on worksmanship. I know if it was done correctly. Now that doesn't address wear and tear. I'm just saying a lifetime warranty on worksmanship. I was comfortable doing that because if it was done correctly, there would never be an issue. But I would then say, I need to purchase those materials. When I allow clients, when I allowed clients to purchase materials, I gave up control, that affected my schedule. And so just something for you to think about. I've even got some small verbiage that I would review with clients when they would say to me, can I buy materials? And I'd, kind of, I'd go through a simple fact sheet. Here's why I do what I do, just to help clarify. And again, 90% of my good clients would say, that makes sense, I understand. If the other 10% say, I want to do this, perhaps I could say, okay, before you put the order in, I'm gonna review the order and you will compensate me for reviewing each order you put in because I wanna make sure it's done properly. But again, that's an individual company decision. The next question, who will be involved in the decision-making process? I'm not going out on a sales call if both spouses aren't present. All right, in most cases, if it's a married couple, both partners are involved in the decision. So I'll ask, you know, gosh, this is a big project. Let's come out and talk about it. Um, I'll be speaking with one partner on the phone. You know, when will both of you be available? And if somebody says, well, you know, I can oversee this. I want to ask you another question. If you go out on a sales call with only one spouse, one partner, what's the outcome? In my experience, there was no outcome because all that partner can say is, I'll speak with my spouse and let you know. So my job was to make sure that both decision makers would be there. And when people say, well, gosh, I'd like to do this myself. Can I just oversee it? My answer was, we're going to be covering a lot of information. I want to make sure that every question gets answered. You know, please, if you can both be there, it seems to be the best way to get this started. Again, 90% of people will say, okay, that makes sense. And there'll be the occasional client who says, no, I am managing this. This is my job. That will be your decision to make, you know, going out and saying, I understand. All right, let's spend some time talking. But traditionally, I would like both decision makers there. The next two questions, and this is really one question I, I loved asking, have you done a remodeling project before? If so, what happened? And if they hadn't, I'd say, do you know someone who's done a project before? And what was the outcome? And I'd ask this question on the phone because I'm looking for baggage. And if somebody said, gosh, our neighbor down the street did it, kitchen remodel, and they liked the kitchen, but gosh, it took a month longer than they expected, and it was for $10,000 more. It was upsetting to them. What they've told me, if they tell me about the budget and the schedule, they're telling me in their answer what they're afraid of. And so I know if I go on that sales call, I'm going to take a sample schedule with me that I provided to my clients on every job. I'm gonna take a sample contract. And when I meet with them and we're reviewing 
their project. I'm gonna say, let me show you a schedule. We give this to our clients and, and guess what? Schedules change. You know that on a weekly basis, schedules can change. But we'll be fluid with this, but I want you to see that we'll, we'll put this together. And there's only two reasons why that schedule will change. Number one, unforeseen circumstances. We don't control that. But if something comes up, we will address it. You'll know and we'll adjust the schedule. That's number one. Number two, the only other reason why the schedule will change is customer generated changes in the scope of work. All right. So I need to address that, which is you control that. Let me show you a change order. We're gonna to put together a project. If you decide to amend something and it happens, I'm gonna go through a change order with you and we're gonna review the additional cost and how that affects your schedule. So I want you to know we'll guide you every step of the way. So I like asking, I like asking those questions. It helps me understand what their reservations are it helps me potentially bring sales material, sample contract, sample schedule to that sales meeting to address those concerns. So here's what I discovered. Like I said, I could spend 30 minutes, 40 minutes on the phone with these folks. That's the time, but, but I discovered also that good clients want to talk about the job. They had a licensed contractor on the phone with them, all right? Imagine a, a patient calling a physician if they know they have the physician on the phone, there's all kinds of questions. Help me understand. We're doing the same thing. Real prospects want to talk about their job. Could be a 30, 40, 45 minute call. And guess what? The benefit of that call is you end up making a connection right on the phone. And the reality is I want at the end of that call, when that client, potential client puts the phone down, I want them to say, gosh, that was a good conversation. I look forward to meeting David at the house. I've already got my foot in the door. Now, I want you to also look back at these eight questions. And I wanna ask you, did you see me trying to sell anything in the previous 20 minutes? The answer should be no, because this call is not about me and my company. This call is all about them. It's about discovering more about they, what they want, the schedule, the budget, you know, the scope of work, the timing, how they're approaching this. And I really want to see, is there a good rapport? So again, at the end of this call, I want them to put the phone down and to say, gosh, that was a good conversation. All right. There's already some bonding taking place. And if I go to the sales call, guess what? That's where we're, we're picking that up right from the start. So if you decide to say no, and this is on the phone call. Remember, you're not going out on unqualified calls. You can just say, it's not a good fit. All right, thank you for spending this time. It's not a good fit. But can I give you the, uh, the name and number, in fact, the website address to the local NARI chapter, that's the National Association of the Remodeling Industry here in Milwaukee. And there's several hundred members. And I'm gonna send you a link to their website you would certainly have a much, you know, you'll have a broad selection of people you can talk to. Would that be helpful? And again, people will say, yeah. And again, I'm being courteous, I'm being professional, not a good fit, but let me refer you to someone. And it could be that you know somebody who perhaps it's a better fit. So give them that name and number. So that's what I wanna do on that qualifying call. So um, Allison, do we have time for any questions or are we pretty much at, uh, at, at termination? We do have some time for questions. If anybody would like to throw them in the chat box or in the Q&A, we'd be happy to, um, David, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, in the meantime, I want to thank David for this presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us and um, passing this information on to our NERI members and our greater family of contractors in the industry. Um, and I wanted to invite all of you to attend the 2020 Remodeler and Supplier Expo. David's presentation today is just a taste of what all the attendees will be experiencing at the expo presented by Neri Milwaukee. This event is happening on November 11th, 2020 in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, and we'd love to see you there. 
This is an educational event tailored to professionals just like you. Attendees will get to hear from speakers just like David on industry specific topics. We're offering hands on training. We'll have an exhibit hall that you can tour to see the latest products and innovations. Plus, attendees earn CEUs, Wisconsin DCQs, and NARI credits while um, fine tuning your expertise and working with other NARI pros. Um, another thing that I just want to uh, touch on is attendees are going to have plenty of space to spread out and be safe in our um, Pewaukee, Wisconsin location. We are excited to offer this event. It's truly a can't miss event for anyone on your staff, whether it's administrators, um, remodelers, um, marketing professionals, whomever it may be, this is a can't miss event for everyone. We are also offering a $50 early bird discount to anybody who registers by October 7th. NERI members from any chapter are, um, can take advantage of the $50 discount as well. Um, I am seeing a couple of things coming up in the chat asking for the slides. David, if you'd be happy, if you'd provide those to me, I'd be happy to send this out to all the attendees from today's um, webinar. I want to thank- I'll forward this to you. Thank you, David. Um, and let me check the Q&A box. So basically everyone's asking for slides. We'd be happy to provide a copy of the slides to all attendees and we'll be sharing this webinar in the future. Um, again, thank you so much, David. Um, we are so excited to see you on November 11th at the Remodeler and Supplier Expo. Thank you. See you in November. All right, thank you everyone for attending. Have a great day. Bye-bye.